we've received a lot of email from people wanting to know your thoughts on the latest riots and civil unrest in Sweden. Yeah, that's right. Understandably. Um, we have talked about this for uh, quite a few years now. Uh, we've we've warned about this. Uh, we've tried to detail to people, for people, that uh, Sweden is not the country that you thought it was. And what better evidence do you have than what's going on right now? The last uh, the last week, we're in the it's on the seventh uh, day or you know night right now, and it's actually quieted down right now. So it's a pretty good opportunity and time to just try to talk a little bit about this and, and analyze it uh, as things have, have cooled down uh, a little bit. It's been going for five, six nights uh, in, in a row, pretty much. And, uh, you know, to the rest of the world, it's just, you know, flared up out of nowhere, you know. It's, oh, my God, what's going on? We thought it was uh, all all nice and perfect up there. What's happening? Uh, but as listeners know who've been with us for a while, that we've been doing our programs with, uh, you know, Alex Newman and uh, Mikkel Jalving and some of these people, we've, we've, we've tried to detail this, that there's like, there's major issues in this society. Um, and there are, there are a lot of reasons for this, a lot of problems. Uh, we did a commentary on the Nordic model. I pretty much called it. I mean, this is uh, over two years ago now. I just said, you just wait, because there are going to be violent uprising in Sweden and it's going to be coming out of the immigrant population um, so anyway I, ha I have a few notes uh, that I just want to kind of run through I want to look at this from a few different angles and hopefully you know just it's kind of from the top of my head so not really you know uh, re really that well noted down everything every single thing I, I there, there are always going to be things you miss or, or you know uh, regret later that you didn't say or talk about. So that's one of these, you know, off the cuff kind of commentaries on, on what's going on. But I've been I've been doing uh, research, if you will, on, on this for the last four or five days. I've been reading a lot of articles, mainstream, non-mainstream. Uh, I've been reading comments, a lot of comments as well, to just get an idea about okay, so what? Because what the media says and then what the people says is two completely different things, as always. Uh, so there's basically from maybe three major points we could look at this from, from the point of view of the, the immigrants, from the point of view of the Swedish population, and then also from the point of view of the media. And then, you know, maybe overall into this is just my own opinions about this. It's just how I see it, what I, what I think uh, when, I, when I see all this, considering I've lived in Sweden for 33 years, I've been doing this uh, work about, you know, with the radio show and, and, and just interested in, in, in these kinds of questions overall how Europe is changing, uh, how immigration is changing everything. And, uh, you know, just try to be fair on, 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 all, on all accounts, but also give, um, give, um, give a good bashing where bashing is due because uh, there are guilty parties in, in what we're seeing. Uh, it's not an accident. So the first thing we could talk about is the media environment, the media climate. Um, we have government subsidized media in Sweden. That means the government steals money from its people and gives it to the media because this is, this is the right thing to do according to them, because they will offer you, uh, you know, we can't have this in private hands basically because there are, there will be too much out of control opinions flying around out there, you know? So the media is the, is one of the biggest culprits in this. And it's been coming in some interesting information about this, uh, from, from different parts. First of all, what I like to say is that across the board in the mainstream government subsidized media, uh, there is an, an, an intense bias against those who actually are critical of what is happening uh, and, and why it's happening. It's, a, uh, it's an ultra extreme left wing media that we have in Sweden. And uh, everyone else who has uh, you know, a counter opinion to this which you'd think in a democratic country, specifically where it's government subsidized, they would have some room in the media uh, because there are there are a lot of these people and they're increasingly so, so for the reasons that we're seeing. But the main problem with this is that government has, or government, but you know, media and indirectly than government through the media has, has shut these voices out. And one of the things that you realize when you begin to watch, you know, kind of the pseudo alternative uh, channels like RT, where they actually are trying to get give you a little broader view, at least, of what's going on. Where they have, uh, you know, oh, they dare to bring on a, a Swedish Democrat or, or a nationalist Democrat, you know, from their their party. So actually, you know, try to share some of their opinions here on this. 
uh, because you won't hear that from the mainstream media in Sweden. That's just out. And there is actually a very interesting testimony about this. There is this one Somali uh, journalist. Uh, she's from Somalia, but she's been in Sweden for uh, many years. Uh, and she has this interesting testimony, pretty much, where she uh, she is warning that uh, the environment is in Sweden is is incredibly dangerous due to the fact that uh, the media is refusing to to recognize the other side. This this lady, uh, try to remember her name here. It'll come to me. She actually she warns or she got warned rather when she was interested in doing an interview with the uh, the the leader of the show, so, uh, Swedish Democratic Party. She was working for uh, SVT, Swedish uh, Television, which again it's it's a you know uh, one of these mandatory licenses that you pay that you have to pay you know if you have a TV in Sweden. So they 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 take your money you know and and then they're claiming to represent you know the people and their opinions and voices and everything else, but they don't. It and th- as this lady's testimony and this is actually a program on. SVT on Swedish television, though. So to their to their credit, this program, which is called Updrag uh, Granskning, which is like a you know, uh, you know, um, <laughs> mission. Uh, <laughs> what would you call it? Uh, mission analysis or something like that. Uh, and this lady, her name is Amun Abdullahi. I think her name is. Sorry if I mispronounced that. Um, and she came to to Sweden in the early nineties. Uh, she'd been doing media, uh, you know, on, on some of these, you know, uh, what do you call it? Public ac- open access, public, public access. access, yeah, yeah. Um, public broadcasting, yeah, something like that on on these more, sm- smaller local channels on on two Somali people because she was, you know, genuinely interested in in beginning and you know, opening up a dialogue between the Swedes and and the Somalis. You know, what you know, how are the cultures different? How can we interact and try to you know understand each other and what's going on? Um, but when she actually found some pretty interesting evidence that there really was a a, a group in uh, Rinkeby, a suburb outside of Sweden, a uh, small group, that's actually just one person, I think, but he, he was a uh, uh, kind of a leader in one of these, uh, oh boy, frit is god, what do you, what do you call that in other, in, uh, in English? It's basically just a kind of a youth center where people can go after school, you know, uh, to, to hang out or whatever. But he actually recruited people to this, uh, you know, quote unquote, uh, you know, extreme organization. Well, quote unquote, it is an extreme organization. It's a jihadist organization. Um, that was it called? It's it's called uh, so many names here. I can't even keep track of it. Yeah, Al Al Shabab. It's called. It's in Somalia. And he uh, he uh, you know he's a very nice guy, and and he uh, tried to attract these young Somalis in Sweden for you know the the jihadist Muslim group down there. And some of them actually left. There's some uh, footage that they show in this program and all that. Uh, but due to her report, it was a long story. It's been going on for many years now. But due to her report, she basically was like ousted out of the country. There was this secondary program that was done on also on Swedish uh, radio, uh, P1, P- P1 uh, the program one. It's called, uh, it's an extreme left program called Conflict. Conflict. And they basically just debunked all her findings which this recent program by Uptor Granskning showed was a complete farce because there was inaccuracies and they really detailed why it was inaccuracies in it. So anyway, in hindsight, she was proven right that there was a, an extremist group and those people in Sweden, in, in Stockholm, in the suburb there, recruiting people to this extreme you know, Somali organization down there. And she just tried to warn about this, basically. But she was in the, the media, and, and I'll tell the story to give you an example of how bad it is when a left-wing program warns on how bad the left-wing is, because it's intensely uh, one-sided here, and 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 she said it's it's dangerous in Sweden because you, you you guys are not talking about this. You guys are completely shut off, and this is going to have repercussions. This lady, as, again, as I said, was recommended by all her staff on, on Swedish television. No, don't you know? Don't don't talk about this, or don't do don't do. Uh, programs about this kind of stuff you know they ended up not you know running certain things or whatever because it will gain it will give uh, you know uh, it, it will give uh, some kind of recognition to the Swedish Democrats you know so therefore just let's just bed you know cover up the truth basically because 
it's it's not what we we know now that we don't want the Swedish Democrats in 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 power. Okay, we've all decided we know that we're better, you know, in our opinions and everything else. So we we know we don't want that. So therefore, whatever we do, however we cover up the truth, it's all going to be for the greater good. So let's not talk about it. Well, now it's coming back and it's biting you in the fucking ass, you know. So how about that? And this lady tried to warn about it, but she's she's left Sweden. She can't stand it. She says it's more dangerous here than going back to. Addis Ababa, or, you know, in Somalia, and this reporter who's like, well, it's dangerous there too. Well, she said, you know, it's more, it, it's even more dangerous in Sweden because of what you're cl- creating with your environment, with your media, not focusing, talking about this. This is exactly what we talked with Mikkel Jalving about, the, the Danish author. A Danish has to, has to come and write about Swedish society. And yet, despite all this, he's been like, you know, call a kook and crazy and all these, you know, uh, programs in Sweden because he actually dares to try to highlight some of these issues, you know. Um, and yet at the same time, you know, in so in the left-wing media, you see still uh, kind of blame being put on, uh, you know, the, the Swedish society and that, that there is a schism, you know, between the rich and the poor. Uh, that And it's, it's a complete, completely one-sided issue. And... The fact is that this would just for further polarize people because this is not the entire truth. There's, you know, multiple sides to, to all the issues. It's just not, it's not one-sided, you know? Um, and so kind of leading on from that, we, there's, there's uh, so many things you can talk about when it comes to the problems there. Okay. Let's, let's focus on another, another potential issue that came out from the media. Uh, another SVT, Swedish television, uh, journalist I, I'd never heard about him before I actually did some background check and see what he'd what he'd done before this guy he's called Joachim Lamott and uh, he he wrote on his blog and that blog spread on all the social networks and then eventually that got picked up by the major media because there are so many hits on it but he said anyway he had testimony that he had talked with uh, with the young people out in uh, some of these suburbs around Stockholm they immigrants who are doing the writing that they that the media were paying them to basically take photographs or shoot video when they were you know burning a car or something like that um he said it ranged well he said that they said that it ranged between you know four thousand crowns for an image and seven thousand crowns for a you know for a video or whatever it's like seven eight hundred bucks something like that yeah dollars yeah so a lot of money to to them of course these kids you know um, and that might be true. I'm, I'm not doubting that. It, as we know, as usual tabloid journalism, they, they benefit from, from having a lot of headlines like that. Um, despite that, though, the, the, the editors in charge of these magazines that, that were accused or the journalists that work for these magazines that were accused um, denied it. Uh, of course, said it was ridiculous. We're not, you know, we shouldn't even comment on it. And it, and it might be, I don't know. I, I, I find it a little curious that he he hasn't offered more uh, more evidence, I guess, more some kind of testimony. If you're a journalist, you would, I don't know. I mean, I understand, you know, you want to keep names off the records and such, but but still, there might be a recording you can make and muffle the s- s- sound. You know, if you're a journalist working for Swedish television, you'd have some gear at your you know at your disposal. You'd think, at least for your self interest as a journalist, you're bringing a camera or an audio recorder or your cell phone record there. You know, whatever. And the only thing he backed up really was saying that he had seen. Um, he'd seen these kids showing him phone numbers on their cell phones that went to to uh, Expressen and Aftonbladet and such, which is these tabloid papers in Sweden. So it, it might be true, but it might not. We you know we need to take all this with a, with a grain of salt. And and uh, I just tried to find some more background on it. And and still to this day, it might in the last few hours there might have been more talked about this. By the time we release this, there might be more evidence for this out there. So I don't know yet, but I'm just mentioning that because we have the story up on the website. Um, and then on the other side of all of this, there's the story that, you know, it isn't as bad at all in, in Stockholm. And and that's probably right, too. It, I think it's bad enough, but it's it probably isn't as bad. It, I mean, Stockholm is not burning. <laughs> I mean, that, we've got to clear that off first. It's, uh, it's, it's in the suburb areas. We're talking about major destruction of, uh, of cars. Uh, read an article today about the insurance companies that have gotten calls. We're talking about maybe 350 cars in total. Um, you know, a couple of million crowns in uh, damages for the cars and more, I guess. Um, and then there's there's local businesses. There's a you know, 
a police station, schools and stuff like that. And and so when we begin to analyze this, we, we realize also then that it's the it, it it the violence is being expressed against the the people that are living in these areas. Um, so if it's true that it's an internal thing that it's coming from these communities, then it's not a very bright thing of of you know toasting your neighbors' cars and uh, throwing rocks at the fire department when they're trying to put the fires out and stuff like that, or or your own school where you're you know you're supposed to get your educa- education so you can grow up and try to get a job and stuff like that. So it's not very very smart. Um, so there's been accusations flying around on all ends of this thing. You know, there's uh, okay. The background to this allegedly is the shooting of this old guy, of 69 years old. Uh, but, you know, he was like flinging around a machete when the police showed up in this place. We we don't know anything about the background, but the fact is that for all these other ones, other people to make the judgment right away of what actually happened is, is ludicrous, you know. But the police shot him. Um, he died, and therefore uh, the reaction coming out from, from different people and, and specifically one organization as far as I've been able to track it called uh, Megaphone and the Megaphone um, you know claimed that this was like a an invasion into their I guess their their place or their territory or that one of their neighbors you know had been shot like there was you know immediately it was like oh police brutality and you know the, the usual stuff that you hear you know uh, despite the fact that the police was there to you know try to save a, a a woman that was stuck with this guy in, in, in the apartment. And yes, we don't have the full story yet, but but to go out and claim as this organization that I've read as well, the Twitter feeds from from the representatives of this organization, you know, that they hate the police and, you know, they want to, you know, it's like if there's been a, a subtextual sanctioning of violence against the police and against the violence at large. And so this is one of those things that just like in London and I think in Paris as well, uh, kind of made the cup flow over, you know. Because um, there isn't a lot of the, the condition. The conditions are, are are bad, you know, in these in these areas. Of course, it is. It's um, it's really bad everywhere. Um, but what's interesting to me is, as I analyze this, it's uh, what's who's been accused so far is is mainly very young kids, young immigrants. We're talking from maybe as young as twelve, maybe even younger, up to I don't know, maybe. 16, 17, 18, 19, and then maybe on top of that you have people arriving from other areas, you know, to spread more violence. They just like being part of it. They, you know, there's a lot of things that adds on from this. Kind of like what we had in Gothenburg in 2001 when the when the city got torched pretty much because all these, uh, you know, <laughs> because all these uh, anarchist socialists moved in and, you know, anti-fascist groups and basically just, you know, torched the whole city and ruined all the businesses and everything else. But, uh so that you have an attraction of other people coming to it. That's just, you know, that's just the way it is. It's bound to happen. But, you know, to try to be fair about all this then, if the if the parents, if, if these are an immigrant, you know, uh, high, uh, rich immigrant areas, what do you call it? Like density, a lot of immigrants in these areas. Uh, Sweden has about 15% of its population immigrants. It's the most of any of the European countries, I think. Uh, we've accept, accepted more immigrants in the last, I think, in the last two years than 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 previously. There's we also linked that up, I think, on the website. You're going to do that if if not yet. That show the the curve. And uh, and and the fact is that that you know you you have to you have to stop at some point. You have to say no. <laughs> wait, we can't just we can't just take in people and we can't take care of them. You know, it's just not going to work. So you have people coming from uh, conditions that are that are bad, really bad, and many of them are also fleeing from from violence and riots and everything else. And so you have to ask yourself: if these are just young kids, um, are they all you know orphans, or, or or where are the parents to these kids to to try to tell them that you know, listen, you moron, this the your you're helping to create the conditions within the country that we fled to that we just were trying to flee from in the country you know that we that we came from where there was violence um there was uh, maybe riots or suppression or there were you know all kinds of uh, horrible things going on that that you don't want to have experienced 
So it's it's interesting just that the the same conditions are created that you know the the parents to many of these kids are, are are trying to flee from, and right away you have you know that this is oh this in the in the left wing media you have this is society's fault, uh, it it's because you know the the gap between the rich and the poor you know blah 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 the usual garbage sorry but it's garbage you know Sweden is like one of the one of the most you know okay. Look, we talked about this last time too when we did the Nordic model. There, there's, there's, there isn't, there isn't upper class in Sweden, but they are, they are so few in numbers um, that it's a complete. It's, there is an aristocracy and there is an attached industrial rich class to that. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a middle class that almost never have existed in Sweden due to the egalitarian conditions that have that have been here, um, and and it's all across the board bad for everybody that, that that is living within this country where despite despite what's happening within the country with uh, you know the pol- with the politics in terms of how everything is is you know taken from you in the form of taxes however how you're re- regulated how you're uh, controlled with uh, you know with licenses and fees and and tariffs and controls and checkups and you you know you can't make a freaking move without anything because everything is so tightly regulated from a central government point of view what what's funny to me is I, I hear no one complaining about that aspect with all the articles that i've read with all the comments very few maybe i can count them of one hand of people have said why you know where where's those people are questioning where sweden has been and where it's going in the future in terms of this rigid controlled society where Everything is so micromanaged; it's, it's unbelievable, and that's where the that's where I think that the rage and the understandable anger surrounding the conditions really comes from. It, but maybe not everyone can put that to words to try to understand it. But it's almost it's an it's an to me it's an opposite um, aspect that you should be complaining on. It's it's not that oh there should be you know more government money being you know poured into suburb areas or or, or there should be you know, uh, more government regulation or control, or they should do m- more to this or that or, or whatever. Well, h- uh, how about just opening up the the ability for people to to run their own lives and take care of themselves, start their own business, let's say, uh, help out their neighbors, offering services, whatever. You know, it's it, miracles have happened in the past before when things are uh, w- when those kinds of regulations are. Are removed, uh, you know, like in Hong Kong in the in the eighties or whatever, and and of course there were bad conditions under under those circumstances as well. But you have to put it in perspective and compare it to what we have now. Okay, what is better? I, is it having a centrally dictating government that slowly and glacially with this with with its policies is making it worse and worse and effectively making itself uh, bankrupt, being this welfare and entitlement society that it is. Or would it be better if people could just mend for themselves and take care for themselves and do, you know, um, start their own business, you know, fulfill what they want to do in their life instead of telling them what they can or can't do. This is interesting lock in Swedish society right now where you have, you know, employee employers who understandably, they don't dare to take the risk and they can't, they can't afford it. They can't, they, they don't. I mean, let's get something straight with human nature. We 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 want, we are accustomed to familiarity. There's a there's a reason as well on the other side. Like the Russian professor said in one of the articles we linked up, um, you know, to just counter our, counter weigh some of the arguments that this is you know some somehow just Swedish society's fault or something like that. That there is a tendency also for immigrants to to attract to their own to 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 be in their own areas. Even this organization, the megaphone, talked about it like this is their town or their area, you know, kind of, kind of way, and it, it's become that too, um, because there are just so many of them in in, in numbers, um, and the fact is that, and the, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's it, it's all it's all good. That's what we do as humans. We we attract to each other, you know, for for the uh, you know the similarities that we see in each other. Um, if language is understandable, that always helps, you know. If we can understand each other, talk, uh, and there's other factors to that as well, which I, which I completely understand. So the conditions that exist are basically that those few who are in a position to be able to employ right now in Sweden, 
um, they do that due to the fact that it's very difficult to fire people. It costs incredibly much to just to hire a person. We're talking about in the millions of crowns for the insurances and all the fees and everything else. And, and it's just it's just out of control. So the, the, the risk taking that you would maybe want to see where, where instead the, uh, the, the, the employer thinks, OK, you know, let's, uh, let's mix it up a bit or whatever. You know, let's bring in some immigrants into this picture. Um, it, I think it's done primarily because they, 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 they don't dare to take the chance. They don't dare to take the risk. Uh, you know, it, especially maybe say let's if the language is a little bit uh, shoppy or something like that, it's not it's not ideal, you know. Um, but if there were conditions that existed that were more, it was it was easier to employ, and it was also at the same time easier to to fire. You could get a more, you could get a a, a fluidity on that or that on that work market instead of this incredibly rigid control that exists there right now, where you basically is. It, it, it's like you're handcuffed before you even begin going out of the gates. This union-run job market with uh, you know promises of welfare, job security, a structured society that socialist university professors have been praising for years now is showing its ugly backside in Sweden because it's not able to adapt or change. It, it's too slow, it's too big, it's dumb, it's not intelligent. It does a lot of damage in the name of trying to do good. It's a disservice. Um, it, the, it's difficult to explain this to somebody who hasn't been under in these conditions and uh, under these conditions uh, to even understand it and put it in comparison. Uh, and at the same time, I know it's it's happening in, in a lot of other places around the world as well. But I'm just saying that there's a there's a disservice that happens in this in this attempt to uh, to put all the pressure on on companies, specifically smaller companies. Who are at the end of the day those who are actually going to you know make the jobs happen here because that's what we're talking about it's 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 money because jobs are at the root of this a lot of these immigrants are complaining there's not jobs to go around they they don't have enough money uh, the, the Swedish companies can't employ they can't grow any bigger because of all these circumstantial things the corporate taxes are are huge but for these mega companies uh, that we'll talk about a little bit later here uh, of course they get tax breaks and everything else what you know need to think a little bit differently about this break things down divide it up it really promote the small businesses those who could employ or people who are in a position where they don't have anything could start something up and employ people get things going they know what to do if they wanted to but they don't want to do it because it's this is about control and so in sweden the conditions are bad there's uh, not jobs to go around a lot of immigrants are on welfare it's a diminishing uh, because the country is going bankrupt, things are going backwards. Horrible conditions. There's nothing to do. Boredom. Long winters. Vitamin D deficiency due to no sunlight and darker skinned people feeling depressed. They're not being told about this. Uh, health is going down. I mean, th there's so many factors here that, it, that this politically correct society just refuses to acknowledge or talk about. The conditions are bad that they're living under. Many of these immigrants are now living in these uh, socialist, um, you know, under the socialist social engineering program of the 60s and 70s called the Million Program, where the government decided to build these horrible, horrible Soviet-style concrete blocks, which is like an artificial cliff wall, and people are just hanging out in these holes in this wall. It's like shoe boxes on top of each other. These are horrible conditions. I've lived like that myself. Um, it's, it's absolutely horrible. Uh, Sweden destroyed its its some I mean in Gothenburg, they through the social programs that were running, they decided that everyone should be taken up to a certain level of quote unquote standard, and they destroyed people's homes, these old ni nice uh, wooden buildings that probably people all over the world would have g wanted to travel to Gothenburg to to be able to see today this older you know part of the of the of the country. The majority of those were knocked down. There were Swedes who were just committing suicides and killing themselves. On I remember my dad talked about this as well. He had this old picture book of, of how Gothenburg used to look, for example. Um, but so in the 60s and 70s, they they remodeled this whole idea that okay, we need to take out these this you know the this poor uh, poor sections and everything. But people were happy there, and and if they would have let people be, 
I think on their own they would have up, updated and upgraded as as you know as the nation become more wealthy or whatever, as people can work for their own money and and make sure what they themselves want, instead of versus this incredibly centrally dictated control and regulation that we now have on top of it. And that's my point of of the you know argument here that the problem that you're seeing in the country is no matter where it's blamed and and directed at, I think ultimately it has to do with the core of the the psychological problem and the schizophrenia that that Sweden has been living under for for these uh, almost past, well, it's more than 100 years. I know that we have to look at history to get the full picture of everything, but, you know, let's just try to keep this fairly in the the modern uh, context for now. And and, and the the social planning that's gone into uh, to Sweden's past. I, I remember seeing this one video because as we try to get a little deeper under the surface here, um, we, we need to talk about the the the, con- the con- conditions of control that that exists in Sweden on a on a on a psychological level, not only on the material level, but um, it's been a very kind of a locked down society for the longest time. Time and and, and I think the world looked at Sweden as some kind of uh, kind of anomaly in, in terms of how it managed to handle itself because it's like for a while it seemed really good like it actually worked this you know the welfare state despite you know what everyone else had had said that it wouldn't do or whatever and it did work for a while um but again i would question the conditions that people lived under the the psychological conditions and we'll get to that but uh so what what has happened consequently obviously what happened in the 90s is that you know uh, the government, together with the banks, completely just, you know, inflated the the bubble. We had the whole bailouts and everything. It's just a bit, as I said before, that Sweden is a testing ground for what is to come in other countries. Uh, and this whole the whole bailout thing uh, happened in Sweden, and people have argued that it was uh, maybe under some uh, more fair conditions because they chose to nationalize some of the banks that they they paid for versus what they did in in uh, uh, in the U.S. and, and some stuff like that. But nonetheless, what it means is that you have, <laughs> at the end of the day, you still have uh, control in fewer hands. You have accumulation of that, uh, of, of, of the means, if you will, into a, a social uh, central point. And people have to question them as well on top of that. Okay, but who is in control of that system? Why are, are we to believe that just because it's run by a government, it's going to be any more uh, you know, egalitarian or objective than any other system. We're still talking about individuals who are going to be in, a, in control and operation of a system like this. And they're going to find a way of of uh, sheeting it or getting ahead or, or fooling it. And I think in the, under those con- conditions, it's far worse to have a, a centrally controlled system than to have one that it's more divided across the board of smaller cells, if you will, of where the quote-unquote power is, is, is distributed. So that means that one or two of them, yeah, sure, they might be, be get corrupted, but people can at the end of the day choose to work with those people or not choose to work with those people. So that's just my point of view on, on, on that. But the psychologist, back to that, I think it was Rollo May. He was up in Sweden and talked with um, the then Prime Minister Ingvar Karlsson. This was the guy who was first elected after Olof Palme was shot, uh, if people remember that series that we did. And... They didn't really get to it in the in this in this program, the television program that was done with this with with the prime minister. They didn't go deep enough into it. But what the psychologist saw when he visited here was was that it was like everything was very very well polished, not at all in a kind of a materialistic way. Because again, as I said, I think the conditions that existed would, was was <laughs> was really bad under the Soviet style buildings that were built and and the ugly governmental and school buildings and everything just looks ugly and horrible when government deals with it. it never looks nice it just ugh, the vibe is horrible and just i just hate it people might love it i don't know i don't, I don't give a shit I, I i hate it i can't stand it the emanation that comes from that just horrible ugh. anyway the psychologist tried to argue with the with the prime minister this was back in the 80s it's like everything is is you know there's a complacency here people are not they're they're asleep it's like they're zombies he didn't say it like that but he but he alluded to it it's like there's it's like there's no life people are 
content with these conditions. He was getting to the core of, of questioning that social control that existed in Sweden for such a long time, that had has existed and still exists in Sweden, where it seems like it, it's more of an, to me, this is my analysis, it's more of an ant society where the individual is, is very much pushed out and it's for the greater good of the whole. And, and I think that that can work in very powerful ways under certain cir- circumstances when you, have, when you want to have, have achieved certain things. And that's the aspect that other countries looked at towards Sweden at with a kind of a sense of awe. Like, wait a minute, how, how did they manage to pull it off? How did they manage to, to, to take so much from everyone that's working that, non, that, that isn't seeing anything really at the end of the day of their hard work and labor that they put in? More than that there is a, a security and an efficiency in society. And I'm not saying that people who want that shouldn't be able to live under those conditions. But there's a flip side to that, and that is that all those people who are who have an individual strive within a country like that are like me, shocked and, and, and horrified under the under these conditions that exist where where it's increasingly difficult to fulfill anything that you actually want to have done. If it's outside of the box, if it's anything different than the conditions that exist on the on the labor market in terms of what the jobs are that that are offered the the industries are very it there isn't a lot of diversity there isn't even a lot of you know uh how should i put it you know culture to a certain degree it's 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 one of these things that also has been taken away and ripped from the swedish population where there's no highlighting of our past of uh the history of scandinavia or God forbid, talk about the Vikings or anything like that, or, you know, runes or whatever that is, you know, nothing like that is talked about in school. It's very, everything is very socially regulated and controlled. And so what I'm getting to is I think that there is a, a subconscious kind of rebellion against that. Uh, And I think that an immigrant population is going to see that much more immediately than a Swedish population who has lived under these conditions for such a long time will see. So they have a point. Oh, everything that they are fighting against, I think, although it's like, you know, that they're fighting against the conditions that they live under, what I think that they really are arguing about is also the conditions that they can't live the way that they want to. Because everything is, as I'm saying now, controlled and, <laughs> and regulated, and it's it's... Everything is in its in its place, very neat, and uh, you even see it on these, you know, RT videos and everything else. Uh, you know, that when they they visit Sweden, it's like everything is so, you know, it's like it's almost like there's no life there at all. It's it's so neat and packaged, and you know, but at the same time, you have this it, it kind of an ugly socialist <laughs> expression of the, you know, of the government buildings and everything else. But at the same time, people seem to be okay with it, you know. I read an article from, uh, uh, I think it was, um, well, it was actually both the Financial Times and then was another uh, UK magazine. It was The Economist, I think. And they, 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 they called it when they said that the problem that Sweden has, you know, what I think then due to what I've just been talking about mentioning, is that those few people who have the ability to create a different type of industry for Sweden are are fleeing the country, are moving abroad. The Economist talked about all these Swedes who were in London who were true entrepreneurs and true people who had out-of-the-box business ideas, but there's no infrastructure for that within the society. Um, if you're... It, it's not it's not this flat out. I'm, I'm, I'm harshening the conditions, but a little bit to make you understand what, what we're talking about. But if you are a true individualist, you are not... You're not welcomed in, in in Sweden, pretty much. You're the the uh, Jantela that we talked about before so many times. Uh, the cultural background of these ten unwritten laws and rules that you know come out of Scandinavian society of how the group is you know superior to the individual, pretty much has something to do with all this. this is, that's the cultural psychological background to the reasons why many of these people are. are well, they're they're fleeing. They're they're exiting out of the country, and the Economist said that that you know for for this reason there's there's a lot of talented Swedes who just they basically leave. They just realize that whatever it is that I want to have achieved here is 
just is not going to happen. It's not possible. And it's a kind of a quiet protest that you never hear about from the outside. You know, Sweden is not the country that you thought it was. If you have conditions that exist in the country where those few people who have the ability to, uh, you know, start up new companies and to uh, create outside of the box industries, not just to these monopoly mega companies that comes out of Sweden, like, you know, Volvo and uh, Ikea, H&M, weapons manufacturers, Bufosh, you have, uh, oh God, Skanska, you, there's so many, ABB, there's so many major, huge companies that come out of Sweden just for the fact alone that they've just been the only company in, in, in a position to operate within the country because they've, they've been, been getting all the government contracts pretty much. And, and if you have a, a population like that who just has basically one client to go to, then, then that company is going to grow itself really, really big. Eventually so big that they're going to be able to move out into the international market and just gobble up business there too. So it's funny that this kind of, that this, you know, it's kind of what we see in China as well, that this really socialist regime is creating these monster mega companies because they've worked together with, with the government and, and gotten all the contracts with them. Um, so, so it's, it's like corporate communism. Exactly. It's the worst of both of them. That's right. Exactly. It's the worst of both of those worlds. And this is what The Economist as well in that same article who, and that line I chose is like the only freaking clarity in that article. But that article is called The Next Supermodel. It's the Nordic model because it has this combination of these two. And they're specifically now talking about this model that have come out of this environment that we've been talking about where you also on top of this socialist regime have now a a a an export uh, a uh, a privatization of these functions that society operated on so but there's see but this is the quirk but they're still under the control really of the government it's kind of like this it's, let's say the schooling system you have very few private schools in sweden but my argument point was always well, but what does that matter if the curriculum is still centrally dictated to by the government where you don't really have a difference in, in, in the education that's being taken place, you know? So what does it matter if someone privately, because that's what's happening in Sweden right now, few people can privately gain, um, you know, benefits from, from owning a function that previously was government, but now is private, you know? And they claim it's, you know, to, uh, to open up the market or to to make it more privatized or to or to divide up this this incredible mon monopoly corporate culture that I've been talking about uh but I think it's, I think it's a lie I think it's a farce I think the <laughs> the the moderate quote unquote conservative party that's in power right now in Sweden who's of course getting all the blame for this who's trying to do this sure they might be genuine in their in their uh, interest of, of, of actually trying to break this up and trying to move to more towards what I've been talking about, freeing up uh, the the market and, and making people's ability to to do their own thing pretty much um, much easier. But I, I don't think so at the end of the day because the the bureaucracy speaks either for or against it, and the bureaucracy speaks against it because it's still in, incredibly difficult to 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 do something, you know. And you're punished out of the gates pretty much. You get a you know check from the government. How much, how much money do you think you're going to make? And we're going to charge you on that money right away before you even manage to get your feet off the ground kind of thing. They don't see, ultimately, this is about control. This is what people need to understand. And here's the conspiracy to all of this, as I've been going for almost 40 minutes now. But, you know, um, and and some people might think, oh, what, how can, ush, why can you have that horrible opinion about what's going on? It's obvious that it's, it's all the, the right-winger's fault or the, you know, the, the, uh, the right-wing politicians in charge. You know, let's just get one st thing straight here right away. There isn't such a thing as a right-wing party in Sweden. Even the Swedish Democrats are, have, have completely changed... Uh, yeah, the Swedish Democrats have completely changed their um, uh, politics in, in the last few... It's it's controlled opposition. It's I mean, God, we've done shows about that too. Um, with the Israel Shamir, when we talked about Zionism and stuff like that, how it's completely... Uh, controlled opposition and regulated, uh, and I think even this this keeping the lid on from the media and everything else is is actually something that and at the end of the day is just completely going to gain more uh, support for for the Swedish uh, Democrats. And again, then understandably so. But the conspiracy to all of this is to is first of all to keep people in a position of um, lockdown. They are we need to control population. 
Um, this is the reason why the Economist calls it the next supermodel. This is the le- the reason why the Legatum Group, who is the uh, think tank behind promoting the Nordic model to the rest of the world, uh, trying to argue that it's the uh, the it's it's the it's the best and ha- people are hap- most happy under this system, which is complete garbage. The guy in charge of this thing is called Jeffrey Gedmin of this Legatum Institute. They used to be based in London. I think they're actually out of uh, uh, Dubai right now. But he he used to be the director of the Aspen Institute in Berlin. He's been a leading supporter of, you know, Henry Kissinger. He's been a member on the Council of Foreign Relations, uh, Council of Community for Democracies in D.C., uh, program of Atlantic Security Studies. He comes out of, you know, he's taught at Georgetown University, a Jesuit school. Uh, he has um, worked for the American Enterprise Institute. And he actually was one of the, uh, he was a founding signatory to the uh, Project for the New American Century, Century, the PNAC documents. This is a major neocon, and that we also consequently have talked about on the program, a Trotskyite, due to the fact that they believe in the exportation of the you know, of their revolution or democracy in this case. They've just revamped the word. He's a, he's a major, you know, he's a neocon Trotskyite, this guy. Why would he be promoting a society like like this, like the Swedish society or or this Nordic model if, if he really was this, you know, right-wing politician? Because he understands that this is what is going to lead to ultimate control and subjugation of the of the population. Because in an environment like that, you are incredibly regulated and eventually after years and years of that glacial change of like not getting anywhere you break people down psychologically and emotionally and so that's the that's the conspiracy angle to all this that it's uh and we could go further with that as well actually we could we could even go so far to say that and i did this i did this in my talk in in on the european union that i did that i just that there's going to be more and more trouble within Europe, which is, it's going to be, it's going to be sanctioned um, due to the fact that they want to have a, uh, a r- rally behind a- an understanding for, for Israel, let's say, and the Middle East more due to the conditions that exists in, uh, in the, in the European countries with these major Muslim immigrants. Where and this is just a thought, just an idea, just a suggestion. I could be wrong, but if you Google Barbara Specter and Paidea, you'll get an idea, a, a suggestion of who is behind making Sweden multicultural. Uh, but it doesn't exactly explain why they're doing it. What if they want to try to create a, a, a new kind of a crusade, basically, where you have a an immensely strong European leader going to come along here? Because otherwise, think about it. Why would Angela Merkel and Nicolas Sarkozy and David Cameron and all these people go out and talk about how multiculturalism has, has failed and just leave people on that note without really offering them any kind of solutions or anything like that. Maybe they, what if they want to create conditions so bad within Europe that they want to have a European population rise up against all of this? And understandably so, because they have been uh, cheated upon by these you know, phony politicians uh, and this complete propaganda and just social engineering and people are being manipulated left, right and center from every angle. They're being completely manipulated and many people are just playing right into it. They're immediately just, you know, pick a side, you know, either, if, you know, for this group or for that group and not realizing that it, what if there's a bigger agenda at play here where you uh, would go into a kind of a, a warlike society, they, 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 the European nations finally realized that you know, we have to do something about this, you know, Muslim threat once and for all, you know. And it's not that it's not a threat. It's the other side to this because they're, uh, what I'm getting at is they're all equally um, guilty of playing into this game of this chessboard and what Huntington called the clash of civilizations because that's where they're taking all of this. Uh, all of these letters have been pointed out to be, uh, you know, false pretty much. Um but there is this documentation about the letters between um, Massini and Albert Pike about the Third World War, how they'll use religion and everything else to create it. 
I think pretty much they have been kind of broken apart that it might be fiction and all that. But nonetheless, it, it's kind of a true and a true a true assumption, you know, of trying to, at the end of the day, use use religion, use uh, racial differences in in just ca- causing major clashes. And I think before we see a potential rise of a you know a strong strong leader within Europe or something like that, they're going to be they're going to be racial wars on the streets of Europe before that time because that's what they want. And again, you have to ask yourself who benefits benefits from this with more control, with more uh, bigger government, with more police, with more surveillance, with more uh, funds for security, and all the things that I've been suggesting in terms of like let's give people a little bit more freedom instead, open up so they can choose where they want to what they want to do with their lives, no matter where they come from or no matter if they're now in a country where they weren't born or whatever. Let's just give them the opportunity to do what they want within uh, reason, of course, and uh, letting those decisions not encroach into other people's uh, freedom. You know, religion and uh, collectivism has a tendency to try to regulate how other people should live, what's virtuous and morality and all that, blah, blah, blah. But uh, conditions of, of freedom, these kinds of conditions have existed in the past in other parts of the world, and that does that lead to some extraordinary developments. Um, of just letting people be, let the chips fall where they may, and we'll see what happens. Um, because certainly, all this control and shit hasn't led to anything good. We're, we're it's still really bad conditions. So you have to compare it. Okay, conditions wouldn't be ideal, but at least maybe in that position you would be able to work yourself out of it. Or if you had an interest in achieving something different, you could. Um, so if all these people who are, you know, true revolutionaries and uh, agitated with what they're seeing and everything else you know how can you how can you be in a position where you vote for more government or more control more of the same that we've seen now in specifically than in sweden for the last hundred years want to do something truly revolutionary although i wouldn't use that word because as we know the the fire in the minds of the men is you know really burning and it's a manipulating flame but something truly revolutionary in this case would to go in the opposite direction, uh, to dismantle the control grid and that structure and then completely letting people pick and choose of what they want to do. Because how can you, I mean, think about this, how can you expect a Swedish population who generously have taken in these immigrants indirectly through their admission of not protesting more to their governments who haven't given them a chance to actually vote on the issue. Um, so in what I'm saying indirectly, they've, they've agreed to it because uh, they're not doing anything about it, or very few are anyway. Uh, and they've uh, opened up their wallets and uh, they've let the government, you know, try to distribute their money across the board and it still has failed. It still does not work. So... What about going in the opposite direction to that? Dismantling that structure and just saying, let people run their own lives and see where this goes. I'm just afraid that it's gone so far, people are so decapacitated at this stage that they wouldn't be able to, uh, they wouldn't be able to know what to do with themselves because they've been so controlled and regulated for such a long time that like, it's what um, the Fabian or the Frankfurt School rather, um, Frankfurt School guy, Eric Fromm called uh, the the escape from from freedom that people don't if they had freedom they they wouldn't even know what to uh, what to do with it basically um, and that's how far gone we might be in the in the country but so at the end of the day I I, I just have to say that I think that all of this is actually really uh, positive <clears throat> because it's good that there's uh, being some shaking up in the country and uh, I'm not surprised that it's coming from an immigrant population considering how asleep the Swedish population are uh, and. And despite this, though, the, you know what I'm what I'm seeing is is obviously an, an anger with everything that that's happening. There's a uh, the most stupid aspect of all of this is that people are themselves, uh, you know, trashing their own neighborhoods and their neighbors' cars and their the local businesses. And I mean, how's that going to do any good? How's that going to lead to anything better at all? It's not. It's just complete nonsense, you know. And and it might be attention or whatever that they want, but I don't know. Ultimately, people have to wake up and realize if they want to if they want to be free or if they not want to be free. And I think that Europe should really watch out 
because they're heading down a really dark path. And uh, if they don't dismantle the European Union and all these immensely huge governmental uh, edifices, it's going to gonna get worse and worse. And we're just going to see more and more of this. And people are unfortunately just going to play into this, uh, the dialectic, the age-old way of changing civilization. Uh, and and then ultimately people uh, people have been stupid enough to uh, to to fall for the the strategy. So wake up, realize what's going on, and uh, step out of it. <laughs>